Okay, everyone, I have 11 o'clock. Are we ready to get started? We may have some joining in a little bit as we get going, but we can go ahead and start with our bios and then fill people in if we need to later. So our present presenters for this session um, is Dr. Amanda Kesey. I hope I'm saying that right. Is it Kees or Kesey? Did I get it right? It's actually pronounced Cuzzy. Cuzzy, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry I butchered that. It's okay. <laughs> She is the Manager of Academic Technology and Technology Training at the University of Central Oklahoma, where she also works as an instructor in both Adult Education Grant Program and the Health and Kinesiology Department. Dr. Kinesi has experience in educational technology, adult education, training, consulting, and project management, including over 10 years of experience working with learning management systems and educational technology systems. Amanda has spent her career working with educators on the use of technology in transformative teaching and learning experiences. As a part of many university-wide initiatives, she has facilitated decisions on the future of technology and education through cross-departmental collaborations. Her team is currently engaged in student success initiatives, including online learning readiness and digital literacy. Um, Melanie Reinhardt is our next presenter. She has been in higher education for almost nine years and currently serves as the Director of Distance Education, as well as a speech adjunct instructor at Seminole State College in Seminole, Oklahoma. Prior to her current role, she served as Director of Financial Aid at SSC for six years, where she was one of the first 70 National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. Um, administrator members to obtain the CFAA certification and currently holds 11 other NASFAA credentials. She currently serves in the Oklahoma State Regents of Oklahoma, Online Consortium of Oklahoma, and the Council for Online Learning Excellence. She was recognized as COLD's 2022 Online Excellence Award for Individual Leadership. Melanie has recently earned Quality Matters credentials and leads statewide initiatives such as Coursera and micro-credentialing at SSC. She also serves on multiple SSC committees with an interest and passion for student success. She has a Master's in Business Administration from St. Gregory's University and Bachelor's in Journalism and Mass Communications from the University of Oklahoma. And then our last presenter is Jenny Maple. She is the Director of Online and Distance Advising Center at Southeastern Oklahoma State University. And then she can tell us a little bit more about herself and what she does at Southeastern. Hi everyone, sorry, I actually was not intending to present today. So I'm filling in for um, our director of our Center for Instructional Development and Technology, who's having issues getting logged in. Um, so I uh, oversee the online undergraduate advising as well as um, the advising and, uh, uh, and I oversee our coordinators at our educational outreach locations. Um, and I have been at Southeastern for about just over 10 years. Um, and I started out as a faculty member in uh, journalism, actually. Uh, so also background in journalism like Melanie. And um, then moved into advising where I've been ever since. So uh, we thank you guys all for um, being here with us today and look forward to a really great conversation. Um, and I guess with that, I'll turn it over to Melanie. Are you our first presenter today? Yes, ma'am. I'll get us started. So first of all, thank you everybody for coming to this session. Uh, we are very excited about it. It is going to be a, a pretty informal session. So as we're going through, if you guys have questions, feel free to feel free to throw those in the chat and Kelly will help us keep on track with getting those questions answered. Uh, also, if you have any input or any ideas as we're going along, feel free to share those as well. Uh, we purposely set this up as a panel uh, to share what other schools are doing so that we all may can get some ideas from each other. Uh, we think, you know, this is one of those areas that, you know, you have to find what best fits you and your population. So the more ideas we can give, uh, the better. 
So I will start by sharing my screen. All right, so at the time that um, I talked to these ladies about doing this uh, presentation, I was director of our distance education. And in that very short amount of time, I've been swooped over to um, oversee our, our business services at Seminole State. So I have been living by the graphic that you see on your screen right now um, is be like a duck, remain calm on the surface and paddle like crazy underneath. But I do know also in, in my role as director of distance education, that was very much the case. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of history of our online degree program at Seminole State. Uh, we are kind of the baby program of, of you know, what you'll hear about today. So at Seminole State, we had online courses. We've just never had delved into the 100% fully online degree programs. Well, we all know the, the little thing that's happened called a pandemic really propelled us forward into addressing that. And so we created our online degree office in April of 2021 with the intention of launching three programs in fall of 2021. Our goal was to have 30 students because we wanted to start small so we can make sure that we had everything set up well and our students were successful. And uh, unfortunately, life had a, a better idea. Uh, we ended up having to launch all 13 programs that we had approved with the Regents. And by the end of the fall semester, we ended up with 97 students. Um, now, the caveat to that is our department didn't really grow any. <laughs> it was still just the two of us trying to uh, service all these students. So a couple of surprising things that we found you know, starting these new programs. We, we thought that we would be reaching out to people that were not in our area. Uh, so obviously Seminole State College has been in Seminole for, for quite a long time, uh, but their focus was mainly on traditional programs. We didn't have a whole lot of adult students. So even with that being said, we thought that, you know, well, if you're in Seminole, they're going to want to come to campus. Well, what we ended up finding was that, no, we were actually going to start serving the adult population that we hadn't been able to serve well before. And so most of our students, I'm sure if you uh, our oversee online programs, you probably find something similar, but most of our are adult students and most of them are in our area. Uh, we have a few that are out of state and we have one program that's really propelling that. And I'll talk about that program here in just a second. Um, but we found that they are, are mostly in our area. We also found that they like to come to our campus for the first, like when they roll for the first time. And we, that was kind of shocking to us. We thought, you know, online programs, like they'll do nothing but want to converse with us online. So we had our Zoom set up. We had our Calendly so they could make virtual appointments with us. We, you know, our phone number, we had our website. And then students kept coming to campus. <laughs> and so we kind of had to pivot a little bit. And then and what we had planned uh, to develop our students with. And so a lot of our tactics right now to make sure that our students are, are ready to start these online programs actually are coming from face-to-face -face conversations with our students, which we like because then you can really delve in and really you know, get, get to the nitty gritty, but it's also, you know, then you also need to develop that program for the students that you don't see face-to-face. -face. We've come back with just try to keep it simple. We also found that the more that we try to throw at a student, the more questions we we asked tend to make them a little bit more shy about starting the program. So we tried, we had to really walk a fine line between making sure that they knew they, um, as our title says, couldn't use an Xbox <laughs> to access their classes versus not making them think that they couldn't do it because it is very doable. It's just a whole new, new model of, of learning uh, than a lot of people are used to. So a couple of the, the pieces that we use with our students, I'm gonna start first with, we have created a, a student responsibilities commitment. And this is actually used for our face-to-face -face students as well. And it just kind of reminds them of things that, you know, as a student, whether you're face-to-face -face or you're online, these are things that, that you need to do, have a growth mindset, right? I think a lot of schools are developing that, that uh, growth mindset curriculum. And so we try to address that from the very beginning. You know, mistakes will happen. That's fine. Learn from them and, and grow. But then also to prepare yourself. Uh, and, you know, when I was coming up for the title of this, you know, I put no Xboxes. Well, that's because I actually had a student. We were very hands-on with our student success. So we were checking on them, you know, every two or three weeks, we checked midterms. And so we had this one student that at midterm, she was failing all of her classes. 
And so I call her on the phone and I was like, you hey, this is Melanie with Seminole Stay. I realized, you know, I see that, that you're struggling a little bit. What can I help you with? She's like, well, I just can't get logged on to my classes. And I'm okay, well, let's let's work through this. What are you seeing? Are you going to the website, going to Brightspace? She's like, well, my Xbox doesn't always connect to the internet. And I was like, Xbox? <laughs> and she's like, yeah. She goes, I accessed the internet before, but you know, so I just thought it'd be fine. And I'm like, well, that, that's probably where our problem is. We have a laptop loaning program. Let's get you set up with a laptop and let's let's make sure that you have the resources you need. And so, you know, through that conversation, we were able to, to help her. So I think, you know, when you start from the very beginning with things like this document and have those conversations, we learned to have those early on, whereas we just, you know, assumed that students would know things like you can't use an Xbox to uh, be successful in online classes. Another thing that we implemented with um, Students in this course is after they're already in the course, but I think that first semester is really pivotal for students and their success throughout the entire program. And so one of the things that we developed to try to help get feedback or even you know, to kind of monitor student success is we created a, a course within our learning management system. So here at Seminole State, we use Brightspace or, or some know as D2L. And so we created this online orientation space. With this space, I've also shared it with other offices on campus that are geared towards student success. So you see here uh, an announcement from our student support services grant. Uh, they're really great at, su at supporting our students both online and face-to-face. -face. But most importantly, we created a content section. And so students have access to this from day one all the way up till they graduate Seminole State uh, in the online programs. And we obviously we update it each semester, but the student knows they can go to this one place and they can find everything from poor, um, academic calendars to how do I navigate Brightspace? How do I contact offices on campus? Uh, we also have you know, a food pantry and a help center. The help center has some virtual counseling appointments available for online students. And so when we developed even our office, we really designed it around a one-stop shop approach. Because again, knowing that our students were adult students, we wanted them to be able to contact one person and be able to take care of everything they needed because we know that they're busy. So we mirrored that onto our, our learning management system as well. One of the things that we did that really surprised me was we created this discussion board. And when I first created it, I'm like, there's no way they're gonna do this. They're not gonna be, interested in having conversations online, but I was wrong, um, surprisingly wrong and really happy that I was wrong. But, so we do things like, you know, the very first of the semester where you say, you know, check in and tell us a little bit about yourself. And we found that the success in that post is that students are finding other students within their major and connecting with them um, or even in their class and connecting. And so we have had a lot of student feedback saying, hey, this was fantastic and, and I was able to get help from my peers and that contributed to my success. We also do see, you can see there in the top one, we do a halfway point check-in, you know, let us know how you're doing. And then we've even been able to um, get feedback from students on that discussion board. And then I will say, turn a student around by being able to offer them resources. Hey, I saw on the discussion board, you said that, you know, you were struggling in chemistry, you know, here's this 24 seven tutoring link. Why don't you give that a try? So with all of those tools combined, we feel like we've gotten to a really good place, even though we're still young and it seems like we learn something new every single day. Um, we feel like we have at least a good pipeline to get our students started in the right direction uh, for online programs. I think just really starting that conversation. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention too, but we worked with our IT department. So on, our, our, on the admissions applications for our online program, we asked the question, do you have a computer? <laughs> and so we know right as they're admitted, if they put no on there, we reach out to them and, and kind of talk them through what that looks like, offer our laptop loan program and, and go from there. So that's a little bit of what we do at Seminole State. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Amanda to talk about UCU. Thanks, Melanie. That's really exciting to hear some of that stuff. Um, and also some of your experiences with students and Xboxes. Um, <laughs> haven't run into that myself personally yet, thankfully. 
So um, at UCO, um, we have several different groups on campus that are kind of focused on um, you know, preparing students or hosting online uh, courses. And specifically, our Center for E-Learning and Connected Environments um, is a group that actually has the instructional designers and they work with the instructors to create the courses. And one of the things that they do consistently as a part of uh, those course developments is they provide a link to um, the OCO's uh, developed, I think I think it was co-developed um, online learner readiness page. So I'm sorry, I'm trying to find my, there it is. Um, so this is actually linked in every single one of the online courses and which you can see it says, are you ready for online learning? Um, one of the things that's come up in some conversations we've been in um, at some point is a discussion between schools on what's required or what they do before they take classes versus what do they do after they take classes. And so at this point in time, these resources are provided as an additional level of engagement for students. It's not a necessarily necessarily a requirement for students to participate with these materials. Um, and it always is a part of a course after they've started the class session. So it's not something they do as a um, pre prerequisite for a degree program or a prerequisite for taking a class. Um, but we really have liked the um, OCO's uh, page, the learner readiness tool, all of the different resources that are in here, um, all of the different pages that students can dive into based on what they need. Um, and I think it helps provide students with a good perspective of what it really means to be an online learner and uh, some of the things they need to consider if they you know maybe had a misconception about what online learning really was or what it would take to be successful in that type of environment which happens quite frequently i feel with students is they've got a um, preconceived notion of what it means to be in an online class and then the reality it tends to be quite a bit different especially if you've got a lot of variety um, between the types of online classes that they're taking so um, the CC group is the one that's kind of helps put all these courses together. Um, Brett King, if you're familiar with him, is kind of leading to all those instructional designers here on our campus. And I work with him quite frequently as a part of my job. So I am actually in the IT department in academic technology. And um, the role that I am playing um, is obviously the technology support. We are the LMS um, group that makes sure that it's up and running and providing resources and training uh, for our faculty and our students on the system. Um, but in addition to that, uh, one of the things my team and I have been looking at is student success and how technology plays a role into overall student success. And one of the things we have noticed over the years is that there is a large gap in student um, digital literacy. You know, they we have a preconceived notion of what they should come to college being able to do with computers and um, what they should understand about uh, file management and hardware versus software and all of those different things. And what we've realized is there's actually a gap there um, between what we expect them to know and what they actually do know. And it's not so much that they're unfamiliar with technology, they're very familiar with it. Every you know student I see now has a smartphone, you know, starting sometimes at the age of like, 11 and 12. Um, so it's not that they're unfamiliar with the concept of technology, but when you're coming from an environment where your interaction with technology is based on uh, mobile devices, uh, the way you interact with your mobile device is very different from how you might interact with an actual computer. And so we were seeing students do things like downloads a, a, a file from one of their courses, but then not know how to find that file on their computer. You know, it's a very different situation when you download something to an app and it just automatically opens up, which is not how it works on a computer. And so we recognize that there's this need for students to um, really have a, a broader basic understanding of technology in order for them to be successful in classes, whether they're online or face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, 
the stress of college is enough, you know, in the current environment and the pandemic and everything like that, the students are stressed out as it is. And if you add on top of that, an instructor asking them to save something as a PDF and they don't know how to do that, there's another level of um, frustration that gets tacked on to whatever else they've been asked to do. And so if we can alleviate that stress and that piece of the uh, frustration for students from the very beginning, before they get asked to do these things in classes, not only will they be able to perform basic tasks as needed from their instructor, but they don't have to worry about that level on top of everything else. Um, and so from our perspective, having that digital literacy uh, competency is uh, something that will really help them be successful long term in a collegiate environment. So uh, what we've been doing, and we're still kind of in our early phases of this, but we're working with a lot of different people on campus to develop a, an assessment, a self-assessment on digital literacy competency skills. Um, and what we have done so far is kind of created a sample of what that might look like in, uh, we use Qualtrics for our surveying platform. And um, what this will allow us to do is um, ask different types of questions about basic digital literacy skills and um, assess where their level is on these different skill uh, sets and then provide them resources to help remediate them if they are uh, lacking in specific knowledge that they might need to be successful. And so it'll be, it's a combination of personal self-assessment and actual, you know, here is a uh, a question, uh, Google Chrome is an example of, and do you know the difference between Google Chrome and a Chromebook versus Google itself, um, you know, and just even the nuances of those kind of things can help them be a little bit more comfortable with their courses. And so based on the responses, obviously, to these questions, then we can say, hey, so it looks like you need a little bit of, of assistance in this particular area. Here's some resources to help you out. And we've kind of divided up these specific uh, skill types into categories like if you don't know this when you step foot on campus you are going to start struggling immediately so this is what you need to start with and you need to learn these things to be successful um and then to another section of okay these things are going to be helpful to you you don't need to know it day one but you're going to need to learn it quickly so we notice you you need to learn a little bit more about how to do successful internet searches and how to do successful research in an online environment and those types of things um two skills like that are hey it's not a necessary thing but you're going to just kind of set yourself up for success if you know how to create presentations that are um, engaging and um, and to do so easily. Um, that is going to help you out with some of your course type of assignments. And feeling comfortable in webinar software is going to help you be more successful in, in courses today. Um, to things that, you know, if you're competent in all of those areas, but you just really want to skyrocket into your creative side of things, helping them um, kind of take that next step into creativity and um, uh, development of creative content that they can use then for their courses as well. So that's kind of uh, where we have started. And the reason that we um, opted for something like Qualtrics is we do use the desire to learn platform. Uh, we use Brightspace. Um, and uh, while we really love that system, you do have to have obviously a password and everything to get in. And one of the things that kind of limits that is we're trying to target students that aren't even on our campus yet. They're intending to come, but they may not have access to all of our systems and all of our resources yet. So we want to provide this to them from the very beginning and allow them to assess before they even step foot on campus. So we put it into a system that's kind of external to needing to log in to access it. Um, in addition to that, we wouldn't be able to share this with other um, universities. We have high hopes that this is going to be super helpful. And so um, having it in a place like that where we can share it out um, is kind of uh, uh, assisting that goal as well. So um, 
we have worked with, this is a, like I said, a collaborative effort and you know, my team in academic technology are working on the initial development of it, but we're working with um, tech support um, technicians um, to find out what kind of questions they get a lot about devices and what do they need. Our service desk is providing um, input. And then we're also working with some of our student success uh, departments on campus, advisors, different things like that, to kind of find out what types of things that they hear from their students frequently when they're trying to help them achieve a goal. And we're also working with our, um, our tutoring center, which is called the um, BELL, Bronco Education and Learning Lab, I believe is the acronym for that. Um, and we're working with them as a part of the remediation resources. So yes, we wanna provide them links to online learning materials, but if they happen to be a face-to-face -face student and prefer more one-on-one -on -one interaction or even just virtual one-on-one -on -one meetings, they have resources that they can go to from our, our Bell uh, tutors who can help them maybe take that next step in their Microsoft Word documents or whatever it happens to be. So um, it's really nice to be able to kind of pull all these departments together because it's, you know, we know what we know about technology, but they know what they know about students and being successful in, in college and being able to pick their brain and understand better from their perspective, the types of struggles that students face um, when they're preparing to take uh, um, higher ed courses has been incredibly helpful for that. So um, that's a little bit about what we're doing. Um, I believe I saw Christela has joined us, but um, I'm trying to find my buttons to stop sharing my screen. There it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so thank you. I, I did make it. Am I able to share mine? Is it my turn? <laughs> it is. Yeah, we should be able to share. Right. Yeah. All right. So. Um, similar and different to some of the things that you've already seen from Seminole and from UCO. At Southeastern, uh, we did make a course, so they do have to have access to the LMS, but we put them in upon admission um, so that they can be doing that before they enroll in their classes. And the intent is that every student will take this once before they start their classes, but then they'll have it as a resource within. Uh, we use Blackboard. So our orientation is called GOLD. Uh, we like our acronyms. I'm imagining how they came up with a bell at UCO is probably similar to how we came up with, <laughs> with all of ours. Um, so our GOLD is General Online Learning Directions. So uh, within this, well, part, part of it was the goals that yes, we want it to be a course. However, we don't want to have a faculty member have to facilitate it all the time. We don't want it to add time to a course degree program. We don't want it to extend how long it will take students to finish. We don't want it to increase the amount students have to pay. So uh, we created this as just a self-paced resource that they have to complete, but it's not for credit and they don't have to pay anything for it. So as soon as students are admitted, they are immediately put into gold and they start getting notifications that they need to complete their gold orientation. And then if they get into a class and haven't yet, they'll be prompted because in the uh, coursework area, they can't see any of their assignments, their weekly folders until they submit a badge for proof that they completed the gold orientation. Uh, we also ask teachers to open their courses a week in advance so that students go in and realize they need to get this taken care of. Um, in the course, we have, um, sorry, let me uh, get a little bit farther in real quick. We do have a fast track option for students to test out for those that don't feel like they really need. Sorry, I'm using a computer that I don't usually use and it is not cooperating in all ways for me. Um, let's see, there we go, nope, yes. All right, so within the gold orientation, we split it up into five objectives. The first four are all information. Just read it, click mark reviewed, kind of like signing a contract. So the first section is all about using Blackboard and the second is um, other technology resources. 
this um, orientation very much evolved over time. We started out with just the MBA students going through this and then expanded it to all of our graduate students and then eventually to the whole university. We first had technology in general and then Blackboard. And then we got several students uh, who pointed out that if they can't use Blackboard, that it's too late by the time they get to objective two, they would have figured it out on their own. <laughs> so we, we uh, switched the order of those. Um, so we have general Blackboard first and then other technology like email, the SIS. Um, in the third section, we have university resources. That includes things like the library, tutoring, um, how to enroll. And then in the fourth, we have student success, which is study skills, what they need to do to be an online student in the online environment. And then at the end, they have practice. And like I said, it evolved. Originally, we had students uh, learn something and then practice, learn something else and practice. But for tech support, <laughs> sometimes it got confusing trying to figure out where exactly they were and what question they were asking. As you know, students don't always use the right words to explain the problem and you have to do quite a bit of decoding. So um, late and often they would finish everything except anything you have to submit and then they had to go back and find those pieces and we would spend a lot of time helping them find the pieces and so when we redesigned it we put all the information first and then they practice and the practice is based on an adaptive release where they have to do one thing before they see the next so if they call in needing help we literally ask what they can see and that's what they need help with in the practice they uh, first are they learn what adaptive release is because so much is based on that including those uh, courses when they go in and they have to submit a picture of their badge um, they don't see their coursework until they do that and so we don't want them to think that there's just nothing in the course there really is a lot in the course they just can't see it yet then they see what it's like to enroll in a group. They uh, have to submit a discussion board and reply to someone, um, do an assignment, and that assignment also involves um, sharing a YouTube link. Um, then they do a non-respondus test and then a respondus test, and then at the end, a survey. And at that point, they get a badge. Um, and then that badge is submitted in all of their courses for undergrad. For graduate, we have a little better system where they submit it for their first course, uh, but for undergrad, they submit it in every course at the moment, <laughs> looking for a better solution for that, but haven't been able to get there yet. Um, hey, we Chris, did, um, Amanda, what was that? Christella, we have a question for you, and I wanted to catch you before you got off this page real quick. It was a okay. question, uh, who developed the curriculum for these objectives? Um, my office, CIDT, is the Center for Instructional Development and Technology. And really, it started with, I mentioned the MBA. In 2016, we partnered with Academic Partnerships, which is an OPM, to do the marketing for um, the MBA. And at that time, not only did we partner with them for marketing, but they gave us a lot of support in instructional design, getting all of our courses cleaned up and put into a template. Um, and they also wanted us to do an orientation. So at that time, I didn't have a very large office. So it was mainly me. And I put together a little bit, you know, thinking this was just a quick informational piece. And then I kid you not, daily faculty came in and said, oh, we need to have this in there. Oh, my students keep asking me this. Make sure that's in there. <laughs> so it grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, and then it's gone through several iterations. But um but over time, we've been able to organize it a little bit better and kind of create those objective type statements. And then um, my staff have also played a really large role. In fact, we have one staff member that that's her primary responsibility is kind of overseeing and um, updating things with gold. And it can be a little bit hard to keep up with because things are updated all the time. There's always new technology that suddenly someone is using. Um, so we try to keep as much as we can in there. I'm not going to say that we cover every technology every instructor uses, but when there are things that a large percent use, um, for example, uh, one thing that we didn't originally have in there was very much about YouTube and how to create a YouTube video. 
But then we had more and more instructors requiring students to make a video and post it to YouTube and share the link. Uh, we had instructors doing that as an introduce yourself discussion board in just general classes, even in kinesiology classes. Uh, we had students in um, speaking classes who had to video themselves giving a presentation to the class. Um, and then even in classes that weren't speaking oriented, but had a final project piece that if it were face to face, they would have um, gotten up in front of the class. Uh, teachers started wanting them to use YouTube more and more. So then we added that piece to just the assignment and decided to just wrap that in. But we also have instructions in there about how to use YouTube. And that's one that we have to update frequently <laughs> because that changes a lot. So does that answer the question or did I get off <laughs> too far? So, um, so really that's that's the, the basic concept of what we do with gold. We do also have some other resources in there. Um, as a course in Blackboard, we're able to put some other things on the side. So we have the main part of the orientation, but then we also have additional resources. And those are especially helpful for non-traditional students who are coming back. We also use it as a remediation program, as basically a study guide uh, before they take a college placement test. And so these are, we have English, reading, math, and we also have the library. So these are not required for the orientation. They don't have to take them before they start a course, but they can explore them. And then some teachers will require them to go and get a badge from one of those. For example, a lot of um, college success, English, and um, even computers and society will require them to get the badge for the library. So for that, they go through five or six modules, um, do some activities and take a test, and then they earn their badge that they can submit to their class for a grade. Um, for English reading and math, we use those, like I said, as a study guide. Students can come in. They're actually competency-based. So uh, for English, for example, they come in and they choose grammar, writing, MLA, or APA. So we use grammar as an example. And then commas is a common one. <laughs> Everyone needs help with that. So they might have a problem with commas in their essays. So they come in, the teacher tells them, I want you to go and complete this module. Now, if they do a lot of pieces, they get a badge. But even if they just complete it, and I'm in edit mode so you can see the end. But um, at the end, they'll get something that says it's finished. And they can just take a picture of that to submit to their teacher. Um, in this particular one, every or uh, actually in in this model for uh, Bolt and Storm, the English reading and math, everything goes from the bottom to the top. So this is the first thing they would see, and the only thing they would see is a pretest, and then uh, whatever they need to work on next is always at the top. Um, for this, if they test high enough, if they get a score higher than 85%, they don't have to do any of the resources. They just jump to the post-test. Um, each one has a post-test in Respondus. And then uh, if they do not score high enough, they get some resources. So you see we have a few videos and some exercises, and then they get to an intermediate test. If they don't score this time an 80 or above, uh, they get more resources or that, of course, they can go back and relook at some others. Um, so we've got some more videos, um, some more exercises, and then they get to a second intermediate test. This one has unlimited attempts, so they take it until they pass it. Um, I've used these in my classes a lot, and frequently students think they can gamble, and they'll take it 12, 14, 17 times and fail, and then they'll complain, and I'll say, you need to go through all of it, and you need to take notes, and they do, and then they make 100 right away, <laughs> and so in that way, they get um, some study skills out of it, too, <laughs> so any, anyway, all of these are formatted the same. Um, we have college placement tests that they can take in a different course, but they're directed here first to get the study material. And they also, if they don't pass that college placement test for the first time, they have to go through here um, and complete these areas before they retake that test. So that was a 
orientation plus. <laughs> um, is there any other questions or anything you would like me to open up? I have a question. You mentioned they have to um, go through Respondus to take it. Is your Respondus the lockdown browser Respondus or yes. is it the one where they're recorded? Um, both. You know what I'm talking about? Both? Okay. Yes. Because if it's the lockdown one only, they would have to be in one of the computer labs at the school, right? Or can that no, be there's all? there are three, there are three versions that you can use of Respondus. Okay. The one for labs um okay is a little bit different but no they can use you can turn on only um only the lockdown browser without turning on monitor which we do for the orientation um for those that are just taking the general respondus test and the reason for that is because of seats and the pricing for respondus mm -hmm. so we, right. we don't want to use all our seats for orientation mm -hmm. and so uh we have them do it there for practice but we don't use the monitor because it, of the pricing Cost. model. That's what I was wondering. Uh, but yeah, but for the others, because they are used for academics and especially because they're used for the college placement test, uh, we have to make sure that it's the student that they claim to be <laughs> taking right. those tests. Gotcha. Thank you. And just to be clear, that post test is not the college placement test. It's, it's a prep for, but we ask them to go through and pass that test before taking the college placement test. Great. Well, I wanted to see if uh, anybody else on our webinar here from maybe a different school had maybe something they would like to either add to the conversation or if you're having a specific problem with something you, you want to discuss, does anybody have anything? And feel free to unmute or type in chat either one. I just want to say I'm working on building one and I'm a one person show at a small at Eastern Oklahoma State College and Christella has helped me um, with sharing her stuff before and I'm so glad I got to sit through this today and hear what all three of those co your colleges are doing um, as I build it. We just changed Blackboard a little bit so I've been on pause while all that updated so this has helped me a lot so I really appreciate everything you guys are doing. Absolutely, thank you. I'll add really to it a quick, and I usually start with this, but I'm like, I uh, wasn't quite there. <laughs> but uh, one thing that I think is really important to me when I was designing it and when we were thinking about how to present this and what direction to go, um, there was a source that I read when I was working on a paper uh, for my doctorate that um, I got to focus a whole lot in that class on orientations, on the models for orientations. And one of the points that was made in uh, one of those sources was that uh, students have to have some kind of orientation into online learning. If there's not one created for that purpose by the university, then the first course becomes that. And the result of that frequently is that the students do uh, don't do as well in their first course because they're learning the technology instead of as much of the content as they should. And then frequently because they do, they don't do as well in their first course, they're not as likely to persist. And so the dropout is more of a concern when there's not some kind of orientation uh, path for students to prepare them. For us in, in our orientation, students absolutely have a hard time with a lot of things in there and sometimes my staff start to think we should just take that out it's just not worth it <laughs> and then we have to remember that no we want them to have a hard time now it's okay for them to hate this it's okay for them to complain here because then they have it done and they won't go through that frustration in their courses and that's the goal so we get a lot of hate for the orientation but it's meant to be hated, so it's okay. <laughs> Have you guys lost any students from not completing the orientation? Um, I don't know for certain on a number. I am sure that there have been some. I know, you know, I can think of one or two that have at least threatened, but I don't know if they did or not. But 
but I know that students can get in there and say, oh, this isn't what I thought online learning was. And that's also the point. Now, we don't have anything that says that you can't. Our goal, our school definitely doesn't want us to weed people out. They want us to bring people up. <laughs> so, um, so if people aren't necessarily capable of those technology skills, our goal is to change that and help them be ready. I would. Well, I was just going to kind of back, uh, kind of jump on to the back of uh, what Crystal was saying, um, because I did have only one uh, in my time as an advisor at Southeastern. I had one student who got in and looked at the orientation and said, nope, I'm going to go somewhere else. I don't want to do this. Um, but I and I will just say, though, uh, you know, I've had a lot more who said, oh, you're going to make me do placement testing. I'm going to go to another school that won't make me do placement testing. So the orientation has not been nearly <laughs> as um, sort of off-putting, I think, in that regard, in terms of me feeling as though we've actually um, maybe potentially lost a student. I really can only think of one that I've had, um, maybe others who threatened, but only one who actually was like, nope, I'm going to go somewhere else. Um, but I would, I would just kind of also say to Crystal's point, I have had more than one one, several go through that um, intending to be a 100% online student and realize that maybe is not a good choice for them. And, you know, as Crystal has said, like, I want them to figure that out now <laughs> when it's not going to reflect on their transcript or in their GPA or potentially discourage them from continuing in school at all. And um, so I have found it to be really useful there. And I do have a lot of students who complain. It's pretty time consuming if they go through the traditional track. I don't know if Crystal, I, 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 my internet's been acting kind of weird. And um, so if you already said this, Crystal, please, everybody forgive me. But I mean, I think we say four to six hours, four to eight hours, something like that, Crystal. <laughs> yeah, and, and students can do it in one or two if they're just, you know, mark reviewed, mark reviewed. But the students who the students who are very studious and good students and really read everything, it's gonna take a long time. So we tell them all, plan six to eight hours, and then you know, some make sure that they don't spend that. <laughs> <laughs> but they have the resource still in there. But yeah, the students who really read every word, it'll take them a while. But after they get into a class, I think that they are often very grateful for it because they realize that they are going to be asked to do all of those things. And it's much easier if they already know how the technology side of it works. So. Okay. And Melissa Ross made a really good point. She said also even the traditional track will have online components anymore at all the schools, et cetera. <clears throat> they really need to learn it and it is better in a low stakes situation. So, yep, exactly. All right, any other questions or comments from? We also noticed the wave of personalities. Our office, we literally label the weeks on the calendar that this week, all of the like good students are going to get in there and their questions will be really nice and they'll be sweet when they call. This week, everybody's going to start getting rude. This week, they're going to be hateful. And <laughs> yeah. The procrastinators, when they get in there the week after classes start. <laughs> Yeah, I know one thing with our program, you know, we have a 16 week option and an eight week option. And so one of our big selling point or what we thought was a big selling point when we started was that, you know, you could start you have a degree in 18 months, you know, and and thought that they would really choose that eight week option to accelerate through the programs. And the feedback from our students have, have been that, no, they prefer the 16 week, like they want to take it slow. They don't want to be rushed, you know, and and that was kind of surprising to us as well. So we actually put in our schedule a little bit in the spring uh, to, to transition a few more of our online classes to, especially like your maths and your sciences, um, making sure that those were 16 week courses instead of eight. We've had the same, we transitioned a lot of ours to seven week classes and I, and I teach comp in a seven week format and I always give incompletes every semester to at least a couple. <laughs> 
because, <laughs> because it doesn't really allow a lot of room for life to right. happen. Right. So we start explaining but not that I don't give incompletes for the 16 week classes either because you know right. something <laughs> always happens yeah we explain to our students like just because it's eight weeks doesn't mean you're getting half the information it means you're getting the 16 weeks of information double time <laughs> exactly and then every once in a while you have a student that wants to take all four classes in a seven week format at the same time no they will leave quickly <laughs> yeah, I know and we try very hard to warn them against it but we've had a couple who do the same or we've had a couple that they didn't actually leave but the next semester they're like I'm not doing that again <laughs> we're like well, we tried to tell you <laughs> so all right well that actually gets us exactly to 1150 um again I just want to express my appreciation for Amanda and Crystalla and Kelly uh, for, for joining me in this panel and uh, thank everybody for attending. And I think, you know, I don't mind hanging around for a few minutes if anybody else has any questions, but I think with that, our program is concluded. Thanks everybody.